that was the election of Woodrow Wilson as a Democrat for the first time since Cleveland. <clears throat> and the Democratic Party all of a sudden gets in because the Republican Party was split wide open with the Morgans deliberately destroying Taft and, and Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller person Taft, paving the way for Wilson himself, but also a Morgan person. See, when Taft got in, Taft, as I say, was the heir apparent of Teddy Roosevelt. And first, when you get in as a successor, you keep the same people more or less for a while. So his his uh, anti-Morgan policy didn't show up for a while. He had uh, Secretary of State, he had a Morgan guy, Secretary of State, Philander Knox, who was a really a Mellon person, but Mellon from Pittsburgh. But Mellons and Morgans were, of course, allied. <clears throat> uh, he had a Morgan guy, Secretary of the Treasury, who was on the board of Mutual Life Insurance Company, which has always been Morgan, at least was for a long time, and probably still is. But, but, as Attorney General, who, of course, files antitrust suits, he had a guy named George W. Wickersham, who was a Wall Street lawyer. And he hasn't been studied much, uh, not, not too much is known about Wickersham. Uh, but we do know he was on the, on the board of his New York uh, Wall Street lawyer. He was on the board of directors of the Interboro Metropolitan Company, which is a big transit holding company. Uh, along with him on the board were August Belmont and Rothschild agent and the Guggenheim. Uh, Guggenheim. Uh, we get to the, the uh, Solomon Guggenheim. So my suspicion is that Wickersham. Wickersham is essentially a tool of Guggenheim interests. We now come to the point where um, the Guggenheim family has been highly underwritten about, understudied. They're a very important family. It gets prominent around the late 19th, early 20th century. The Guggenheim family was um, essentially discovered copper. And uh, they were German Jewish uh, peddler, I think, Meyer Guggenheim, the original one. and uh, went to the West and discovered copper. And anyway, they wound up, he and his, I think Daniel Guggenheim was, a, was a sort of the patriarch of the second generation. Uh, they really own all the copper in the United States. So every copper company was originally a Guggenheim company. It means American Smelting and Refining, Kennecott and Anaconda, the three top copper companies, were originally Guggenheim owned. So extremely wealthy, and yet nobody talks much about them. They haven't been written much about. They were they didn't have the flair of the Lehman Brothers or Kuhn Loeb, et cetera, but extremely important and underwritten, I mean, under scholarly, understudied. Uh, very important and what really controlling the Wilson administration in many ways, <coughs> uh, and uh, along with Morgan. So, an independent group, and, uh, and uh, we'll see about when we get a little bit later on. Essentially, the, the control of Bernard Baruch, who, who was the, the absolute czar in World War I, economic czar. And uh, not only not only was Bernard Baruch I'm right now, uh, not only was he the head of the War Production Board, totally running the whole the whole economy in World War One, he was a beloved figure, ran everything, a top presidential advisor until about the 19, late 1940s. In other words, for 30 years, this guy was really running the whole country, more or less, regardless of the, of the political party of the president. In other words, he was a Democrat, but he was a powerful advisor to Hoover and to everybody else. In other words, everybody, Eisenhower, as a matter of fact, when Eisenhower became president in the fall of 52, the first thing he did was give a dinner in honor of Bernard Baruch, and he said, everything I, owe, I am that I owe to Mr. Baruch. It turns out that he was a major at West Point in the 40s, uh, 30s. He was part of Baruch's study group. Uh, <laughs> at the time when he was just a major nobody knew anything about. <clears throat> so, I think he was literally true. And I, was, I think Eisenhower was essentially Baruch's creation, along with the Morgans and other Wall Street people. But here's Baruch, and, he, and uh, not only was he a very strange phenomenon, Baruch, because he, um, he suddenly he was unknown more or less until World War I, when I say he becomes the economic czar, head of the War Production Board, with abs absolute collectivist control over the economy, running production and, and prices and everything else, in collaboration with big business groups. I haven't gotten to World War I yet, but since I'm on Guggenheim, I'm, I'm sort of anticipating a little bit. The question always entered my mind when I was growing up was, here's this guy who was running everything, was the advisor of every president. Why did he get that powerful? Who the hell was he anyway? And the usual answer of orthodox historians is, well, he, he made a million dollars on the stock market. Well, okay. Lots of people make a million dollars on the stock market. They don't become total czars of the economy and totally beloved by everybody. In other words, it was considered impossible for anybody to criticize Baruch. 
In the press, he was above criticism. He would make idiotic pronouncements on the park bench, and the New York Times would report every word. Uh, he would sit on a park bench in Central Park. Those days, of course, he didn't get mugged all the time in Central Park. <laughs> he'd sit on a park bench and issue pronouncements, and they'd, take, and he'd make these idiotic statements. He'd write books, his autobiography, for example, is a totally, totally worthless autobiography. What he'd say in there is, my advice to every young man trying to get, make a million dollars in the stock market is, and he said this very seriously, he's a pompous, pompous ass. He'd say, my advice is buy when the stocks are cheap and sell them when they're, when they're high. Great advice. <laughs> Any moron knows that. question is, when, do, when are they going to be cheap and when are they going to be high? That's the, <laughs> he didn't tell us that. Anyway, how did he get so beloved? How did he get to, how did he evolve into power? And why did he stay? He virtually ran the New Deal in many ways. He organized a farm block, the whole farm price support program was essentially Baruch creation. He, he seated people into government. He was always mentor of various people and got them into, into power. He really ran the NRA and the AAA through his agents. Now the question is, why, why was he so powerful? Why was he above criticism? <clears throat> um, and the, uh, the answer only came out, first of all, he, there was no biography of Baruch. He wouldn't give his papers to anybody. He wouldn't allow anybody to have them. He finally got a, a Margaret Coit wrote a biography. It was fairly worthless. It's finally a good biography after, after all this time. Uh, a few years ago, there appeared a biography by Jonathan Schwartz called um, Mr. What was it? I mean, the thing, the Speculator, I think. Yeah, the Speculator, the story of Bernard Baruch. Excellent biography. It really has a lot of stuff in there, more than he realizes, in a sense. And it's pretty clear from his, from his biography, I think it's called Mr. The Speculator. It came out a few years ago. It's pretty clear from biography is that uh, he was a lousy stock market speculator, Baruch. He, he lost money every time he invested on the stock market. For one thing, he was a big railroad fan, and he would invest in railroads heavily, and he started investing in railroads after 1900 when railroads entered their big secular decline. In other words, he starts heavily investing in railroads just about the time railroads are punking out as an investment. So the guy was a lousy investor. So if he's a lousy investor, how did he make a lot of money, and how did he become the big shot? Well, <clears throat> he turned out to be a, a friend and, and uh, disciple, mentor, mentee, protege. Of the, of the Guggenheims. In other words, his father, Dr. Simon Baruch, was a Georgia physician, migrated to New York City around 1900, 1890, whatever it was, and became a um, big shot physician, a Park Avenue physician, so to speak. One of his client, one of his patients was Daniel Guggenheim, the mentor of, the, uh, of Solomon, which one was, I think, I think Daniel, anyway, the patriarch of the family at the time. And since the Guggenheims liked him, the Guggenheims were immensely wealthy, and they took him under their like a bright young man, I took him under their wing, and I gave him his first job in a stock on Wall Street, etc. And he became sort of a, a sort of a running fan of the Guggenheims, and they tell and they would tell him when to invest. We're going to invest in X, no, such and such a stock, and he'd invest along with them. Whenever he did that, he made a lot of money. When he invested on his own, he lost money. That was the key to his the key to his stock market success was following the Guggenheims and being their protege and general hanger on. So essentially, Baruch was equal Guggenheim. In other words, around Baruch, you can say parenthesis Guggenheim, which accounts for his vaulting to fame. Uh, as we'll see in a minute, Woodrow Wilson was essentially a Guggenheim Morgan person, and uh, Cleveland Dodge, uh, mostly the major industrial mentor, uh, head of the Phelps Dodge Company, which was uh, uh, copper involved in copper and the whole Guggenheim, sort of related ally with the Guggenheim. Uh, <clears throat> It's a very revealing thing in, in, in a, a biography, the best biography of Ho Herbert Hoover, one of the best ones by David Berner. I just mentioned, I just mentioned this in passing. It's like a throwaway line. They said Hoover was invited to become Secretary of Commerce by Daniel Guggenheim, and he turned it down. And I, I, I stopped. Immediately I stopped. You have to be alive for the situation. What is this? Why, why does Guggenheim have the power to offer somebody Secretary of Commerce a cabinet post? <laughs> okay, who the hell is Guggenheim? It's obvious that Guggenheim had great power in this administration. It's also obvious that it must have been the Wilson administration because there's no other relevant one. I mean, Hoover was Secretary of Commerce during the 1920s and became president after that. So it must have been the Wilson administration, and therefore it's pretty clear that Guggenheim has a great power, obviously through Baruch and, and also uh, Cleveland Dodge, was an old pal of Wilson's. Anyway, I'll get to that in a minute, but I'm just demonstrating that Guggenheim had a great power. My suspicion is that Wickersham is basically a Guggenheim tool. And it was Wickersham who, at Taft's behest, uh, started around the second two years of his administration, around 19, he gets into 1980. Around 1910, uh, Taft starts filing through Wickersham 
antitrust suits against International Harvester and U.S. Steel, uh, or Morgan Trust, in other words, plus I think Allied, Alice Chalmers, other Morgan company. Anyway, in other words, it's finding a lot of antitrust suits. So, so Taft, it can only be interpreted as saying, here's, here's, the, here's what happened. Remember during the Teddy Roosevelt administration, we have a savage attempt by the Morgans to smash Teddy Rockefeller. William Howard Taft, an Ohio Republican, therefore basically in with the Rockefellers, okay. uses Wickersham, after he gets settled in there in 1910, uses Wickersham Attorney General to file a whole bunch of antitrust suits against Morgan companies to try to break them up. Now, they, they failed. I mean, the Supreme Court threw them out eventually. But the point is, for several years here, for at least the last two years of the Taft administration, the custom of tax on the, uh, tax on the, uh, um, on the Morgan Trusts. Other guys I can mention, the Supreme Court judge, whom Taft uh, makes a point as a member of the Supreme Court, uh, was Charles Evans Hughes, who had been with uh, New York, governor, former governor of New York, who was a lawyer for the Spanish Oil Company in New Jersey. So, later in the New Deal period, becomes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Rockefeller person. So, with Taft coming in, we have a, a retaliatory thrust, retaliatory strike, <laughs> and uh, attempt to break up Morgan, uh, sold on Morgan, using, in other words, the Sherman Act. So it has, but from 1990 to 1900, the Sherman Act is a dead letter, not being used, nobody cares about it. Then, in 1901 or 02, whenever it uh, occurred, Teddy Roosevelt brings the Sherman Act out of the closet, uses it as a club to smash Standard Oil on behalf of the Morgans, and then when Taft gets in, he starts using the antitrust law as a retaliatory club against the, Rock against the Morgans on behalf of the Rockefellers. So as this happened, uh, the Morgans, the very powerful Morgans, react very, very badly in this thing, very, 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 very bitter, very PO in this. Not supposed to be, not supposed to do this to the Morgans. And so the Morgans create a whole new party, third party, the Progressive Party, created out of Senate here in 1912, the object of which is to destroy Taft. <coughs> Taft, of course, gets the renomination to be incumbent president. So they create a new party called the Progressive Party. The Secretary Treasurer, the national head of the Executive Committee, I think it was called, was guess who? George W. Perkins, Morgan partner, was also been called Secretary of State for the Morgan Empire. <laughs> Um, so Perkins sets up the Progressive Party, brings Teddy Roosevelt out of the closet, so to speak. Teddy Roosevelt was off in Africa on safari, usually in these two years. <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt's all upset that the Taft is attacking Morgan. By the way, he says this openly. He says, terrible thing, he's broken my agreement with the Morgans. My agreement never to, you know, never to, to use antitrust against them. The Morgans are good trust, and here, here Taft's daring to break with me, and so forth and so on. So Teddy Roosevelt comes back out of comes in a comeback, comes back out of retirement to run for another term, a third term, in 1912, on, on the Progressive Party label. Interestingly enough, here's the Progressive Party. Their, their platform was very progressive in a sense it was very corporatist. All the planks of the National Civic Federation, the idea of government, uh, total regulation of industry, eliminating laissez-faire. For example, they call for strong national regulation of corporations, uh, uh, preferably having uh, have a Corporations incorporated by the federal government. Uh, anyway, here's what they say. We demand a, a federal commission, such as the Interstate Commerce Commission, once again that's being repeated, to attack, quote, unfair competition, unquote, and force capitalization, quote, unquote. Now, what does this mean? In other words, we need a, a government bureau to regulate competition, right, regulate all of industry, rather, like the ICC, to eliminate unfair competition. What is unfair competition? That's a code word to mean competition. Unfair competition means competition. It means you have to get rid of competition and have restricted cartelization. Unfair means they're cutting prices. That's what it means. <laughs> uh, forced capitalization, what does that mean? It means too much capitalization. It means to restrict the amount of capital going into industry. In other words, to cut production. It's another, again, another way of, of talking about cartelization. Again, quoting from the um, Progressive Party platform, again, they call for compulsory publicity, an old theme we've been mentioned before that says to eliminate secret price cutting. And they say, quote, it's the Progressive Party platform in 1912. Um, he got more votes than Taft. It very, became a powerful party for, for that moment. They, they, they scuttled it after the election. Um, quote, thus the businessman will have certain knowledge of the law, 
The investor will find security for his capital. What does that mean? It means he restricted competition. That's why they'll find security. Dividends will be rendered more certain. Under such a system of constructive regulation, quoting Phil, legitimate business, freed from confusion, uncertainty, and further litigation will develop normally, unquote. So in other words, if they say in polite language, is what will stabilize industry, we will cartelize it, there won't be any more competition, there won't be any confusion, uncertainty, we will make the world more secure for businessmen by cartelizing it. <clears throat> the progressive party goes on to cite Germany, Bismarck, Bismarck type Germany, as the ideal example, the model to follow. For in Germany, quote, this does not, not prevent these guys from, from favoring war with Germany, of course, in a couple of two years. But anyway, that's, uh, they cite Germany as a domestic, as a, for their basic policies. In Germany, quote, their policy of cooperation between government and business has a comparatively few years made them a leading competitor for the commerce of the world. And again, quote, the time has come when the federal government should cooperate with manufacturers and producers in extending our foreign commerce, unquote. Taff accused Teddy Roosevelt of selling out to Morgan on the Steel Trust. That's the thing. By the way, you'll find out about, the only way you'll ever find out about what's going on in politics is when, and during campaigns, when each party really reveals some of the, the dirt on the other, on their opposition. Both parties usually right. So, uh, <laughs> at any rate, the um, Wilson, of course, also came out for government regulation of reasonable competition and reasonable co combinations and all the rest of it. They all, they all now agreed, whereas Professor Jeremiah Jenks, after the election was over, a cor economist at Cornell, one of the prophets of this new, new economics, said, now the campaign is over, quote, we have to get on with the constructive work of stabilizing the system, unquote. So, uh, now, the Progressive Party was backed by almost all big businessmen, by a whole bunch of them. 90% um, of the Union League Club of Chicago, which is the all the top businessmen in Chicago, 90% backed Teddy Roosevelt in this, this three-corner three election. Okay? So with Teddy Roosevelt and the Progressive Party, a half of a Republican, and Woodrow Wilson, we'll mention in a minute, a Democrat. At any rate, the... Uh, so George W. Perkins, so 90% so of the business of the Union League Club of Chicago backing Teddy Roosevelt. Two-thirds of the leaders of the Progressive Party, two-thirds were big businessmen and, and big business lawyers, and the other third were, pro were professionals and educators. In other words, everybody in that party were urban, upper middle class or upper class, almost all wasps, and almost all Republicans or ex-Republicans. So George W. Perkins really set up the party, uh, and Frank, another powerful person was Frank Muncy, who was a a big newspaper publisher. He was heavily invested in Morgan companies. That was associated with a Morgan. Heavily invested in U.S. Steel and International Harvester. So we have Muncie, who's a Morgan person, and Perkins, who was a Morgan partner, leading the drive for Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, let's say two thirds of the, of the uh, progressive leadership, progressive party leadership, were, were, were businessmen. Um, and uh, I think I mentioned the fact of the. The Progressive Party convention, 1912, was, was solidly uh, was a combination of Morgans, Pietists, social workers, Jane Addams, all these people, tech technocrats, engineers, uh, historians, economists, uh, all, all, all these interventionists, all, all gather there. And, and with, progressive, with him singing, uh, uh, him singing, dotting the whole speech, I think I mentioned this when Teddy Roosevelt gave his keynote address. He used, deliberately used the Christian pietist uh, imagery. He said, we, he, he wound up with a famous peroration. He wound up by saying, we stand in Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. And uh, in between, they shout amen and so forth. And they, then they sang Christian hymn, we shall follow, 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 substituting Roosevelt for Jesus. So the whole thing was filled with pietist rhetoric and deliberate references to uh, pietist hymns and, and, and imagery. <clears throat> Uh, so you had a combination of all these guys, Morgans, uh, big businessmen, technocrats, uh, progressive social workers, and pietists. The only big business people who were for Taft were, were uh, old rich Rockefeller people, of course, Senator Oldrich and the Rockefellers. And uh, Ella Hugh Root, who for some reason was disenchanted, I think he wanted to be president after all, he wanted to get the nomination somehow. Uh, Saw a PR for not making a president or whatever. He's not personally peeved. And Knox stuck with um, Taft. That's about it. So in other words, the Progressive Party was organized in order to smash Taft. And like Wilson, this was accomplished. So then the question is, who was Wilson? Where, who were his backers? Where did he come from? 
Woodrow Wilson was not one of my, not one of my favorite people, to say the least, in American history. As a matter of fact, I can't think of anybody I dislike more. He was a, <laughs> combine all of all the virtues we're talking about, he was a pietist, uh, Southern, Southern Presbyterian, um, professor, PhD, a new prog a progressive historian, and, uh, and political, political scientist, and imbued with not only the idea of saving the soul by saving everybody else, but also saving the world, brought us in the World War I. So, um, Christianizing the world as well as, uh, as, well as the, the country, so to speak. The, um, his major political, he was president of Princeton, and for several years, he had a lot of trouble with Princeton. He, uh, his major political mentor, until almost the day he was elected, when they had a mysterious split, George Harvey, who was the head of Harper, Harper and Brothers Publishing Company, and Harper's Weekly Magazine. And by 1906, when he was still president of Princeton, Harvey decided to groom him for president. And the whole thing, whole campaign, making him governor of New Jersey in 1910, and then getting him nominated in 1912. Harvey was a New York City executive. He was became president of Harper. He was also a business executive in general. He was closely connected with William C. Whitney and Thomas Fortune Ryan, New York, of the, the Morgan-oriented uh, faction magnate, and also Walter Oakman, who was a big Morgan type, should be mentioned here, he was the president of Guaranteed Trust Company, which is Morgan's major bank. Commercial bank. So uh, he's heavily and heavily hip deep in the Morgan. He's a close friend of Morgan. And uh, in 1900, Morgan was owned Harper's Weekly and Harper Brothers uh, Publishing Company. In 1900, was in bad financial shape, and Morgan asked his old buddy Harvey to become president, to take it over, and, and run it. So Harvey and Morgan were very closely allied. So we have, in other words, Morgan pushing both Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson. And to say Harvey gets out of favor of Wilson until the end of the 1912, but basically it's still his political mentor until like, at least until late 1912. Another thing that happens was uh, a little very peculiar thing about, uh, about Wilson is that he meets in 1911, 1912, he's beginning to run for office of president. Uh, his campaign is gearing up late 1911, early 1912. He meets Colonel, Colonel Man Edward Mandel House, the Texas uh, businessman and politician. And first of all, his colonel, and like, it's always great, great time. He's not really as a fake colonel as many Southerners are. He just gave himself a title of colonel. Hi, that colonel. Uh, but it wasn't a colonel at all, okay? So, <laughs> colonel in quotation marks. The House is a Texas politician. He likes to dabble in Texas politics. And, uh, okay, Texas is an important state, but after all, it's not the top state in the Union. And he meets, meets, he meets Woodrow Wilson, he wants to, make, wants to be a president maker. Lots of people like to be president makers. And he says he's going to help Wilson get elected, okay? And then Wilson asks him, what would you like to do in my administration? And House says, I'd like to run your foreign policy. And, and Wilson, Wilson says, okay. And what kind of a thing is that? I mean, the, 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 the rational person reading this will, say, will stop and say, what in the hell is going on here? You don't meet some colonel from Texas, some folk, fake colonel. And uh, he said, yes, yes, you, you, you could take over my foreign policy. So it's, it's very weird. Nobody's really, there are no, there's no decent biography of House even today. In other words, very, very little study. His, his diaries were published by uh, Professor Seymour at Yale, but these are just his diaries. He just sort of, uh, he didn't really do anything. And there's, there's one biography of him in his Texas years and another couple on Versailles Treaty, but there's no real biography of House. I mean, it's an amazing thing. There's 10,000 American historians, each of which, they have to get a PhD, so they have to write something, and nobody's done a biography of the House, and it's incredible. Here this guy was running the entire foreign policy of Wilson administration, even though he had no, no office. He, he never was a government official. He was just sitting in the White House all the time. He was an absolute master of foreign policy. The Secretary of State had no power. He was making appointments for Wilson. Almost all Wilson's cabinet appointments were cleared through House. House advised him. He picked so-and-so for Attorney General, picked so-and-so for post General. And Wilson would listen to him, an abject tool of Colonel House. So who the hell was Colonel House to say he was a Texas politician? It makes it pretty, too weird. Now, there have been all sorts of psycho, psycho babble studies of Wilson and, 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 and House. Why is Wilson, why was Wilson dominated by House? Why, what was the Spengali-like power? House out of the Wilson. Uh, Freud, I think, wrote a, um, a study of Wilson and House. Uh, but none of this stuff, I mean, all of, all, all of this stuff seems to me is meaningless. There's no, there's no, <laughs> there's, 
there's no real, there's no demonstrable reason why Wilson should have been dominated by House. Wilson's a pretty tough character, and so is House. And so uh, we, have to, we have to look for House's more uh, deeper connections here. <clears throat> uh, not only that, but it's now known that House, even though it's supposed to be a loyal tool of Wilson, that was his, I'll carry out all of your orders, master, that sort of thing, he's constantly going behind Wilson's back in order to drag us into war on the side of England. In other words, he, was, he acted almost unofficially as a British agent. He would conspire with a British ambassador and the British Secret Service. So if Wilson was a little bit reluctant to get into the war, as we say, we first will see, we, he finally did. How to maneuver with the British this loyally against, uh, behind Wilson's back to force them into it. So it's, very, it's a very strange situation. And uh, to say there's a little, some, some kind of cycle of babble doesn't, 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 doesn't fit. So who was House? He wasn't just a Texas politician. He was, first of all, he was a multimillionaire. His father was a third largest, third wealthiest person in Houston, Texas, for the moment. He had a lot of cotton land. He had a lot of, he was a banker. And he was also a railroad owner. He owned the tech. Trinity and Brazos Valley Railroad, an important railroad in Texas, of which the colonel was the uh, manager. Uh, and railroad, of course, means if you, if you hear the word railroad, you immediately suspect Morgan by this time. Sure enough, this railroad was financed by the old colony trust company of Boston, uh, Boston Financial Interest, which are heavily involved with Morgan. So we now have a Morgan connection. Also, House's daughter. Mary Gordon Alkencloth of the famous Alkencloth family, which, from which Jackie Kennedy Onassis emerged, has emerged. Um, Gordon Alkencloth was a, uh, was a, a member, of, uh, a, a partner, or excuse me, a director of the Illinois Central Railroad, which is, of course, Morgan. So we have definite Morgan connections with the Colonel. And uh, it's better, it's, it's, he sounds, of course, he's more amenable to the public. Because in Texas, nobody, nobody associates association with Morgan as they would have L.A. Rue, who was a Morgan lawyer. So here he comes in, he, he takes over the government as Wilson, when Wilson gets in. <clears throat> um, who recommended the House to Wilson anyway? How, how did he get him? He, got, he, got, he met him through Harvey. So we have a Harvey, the Morgan Harvey House connection. In other words, Harvey says, talk to Colonel House. He's a, you know, Wilson was his vice in all the whole thing. <laughs> Wilson himself, before he became president, was a, um, well, before we get to Wilson himself, there were other key advisors of Wilson, in addition to Colonel House and George Harvey, there was Cleveland Dodge, I already mentioned, was a uh, Phelps Dodge copper magnate, and uh, in with the Guggenheims and Morgans, and uh, George Peabody, who was a New York City banker, and I've already mentioned this, that Peabody, Peabody, who came from an old Boston family, uh, one of the Peabody's was a, was a Peabody family, a distinguished old Boston family. One of the Peabody's was a partner in a bank that Morgan's father was a partner of way back in the mid-19th century. Junius Morgan, banker, was a partner of the same bank as George Peabody, as, as one of his ancestors. And another Peabody was best man at J.P. Morgan's wedding. If you, were, if you were not a high school chum of Morgan and Rockefeller, it would be a good thing to be a best man at his, at his wedding. <laughs> so anyway, a very strong... So Peabody was definitely a Morgan person. Dodge was sort of Morgan Guggenheim, both, I would say, in that area. And House was probably Morgan, and Harvey was Morgan. So his Wilson is surrounded by Morgan people. Now, Wilson, before he becomes president, was on the board of directors of two companies. It's true he was a scholar and all that stuff. He was also a member of the boards. He's a member of the board of the Carnegie Foundation. He's also a member of the board of Mutual Life Insurance Company, which is a Morgan company, Morgan's top life insurance company. So, um, so here we see Woodrow Wilson, academic, PhD. The only PhD that's ever become president, a total disaster. Watch out for PhDs running for office. <laughs> uh, PhD, professor, and Morgan tool. Okay? And also in with the Guggenheims. Okay, what's, so what, what was his cabinet? <clears throat> Wilson gets in. I say Wilson gets in, he squeaks in because Teddy Roosevelt splits the Republican vote. And by the way, when Wilson was reelected in 1916, he just beat out Charles Evans Hughes, the Rockefeller person for uh, president, by a squeak, a real squeaker. I mean, Republicans almost won, even though Wilson was still president. Uh, <clears throat> so what's the Wilson cabinet like? Well, he has to make, make sure William Jennings Bryan Secretary of State. He has to do that because Bryan sold out. Bryan. Um, Shifted from Champ Clark, who was a progressive Democrat, Missouri, to Missouri. The last ballot <coughs> shifts his, throws his support to Wilson. This is obviously a deal was made. Brian gets to be Secretary of State. 
So Wilson had to do that. It was, it was, uh, mine doesn't have much power, I would say. Anyway, House is running the whole thing from, from, the, from one of the unofficial Oval Office, so to speak. And uh, he makes the Secretary of Treasury, which is more important from economic affairs. Secretary of Treasury, very interesting guy, William Gibbs McAdoo. Now, McAdoo is from New York City, and was, most historians said, well, he was sort of a, just a regular progressive or something, baloney. McAdoo was the president of Hudson Manhattan Railroad, which used to run the tubes from New York to New Jersey, Hudson Tubes. It was originally called the Hudson and Manhattan Railroad. It was a very big railroad, $120 million capitalization, which was very big in that period. One of the, I think, the 12th largest company or something like that in the country. It was in the top 100, anyway. Top 100, Fortune 100. Uh, so who was, on, who, was the, who was running the Hudson Manhattan Railroad? Well, the Hudson Manhattan Railroad, McAdoo was president for many years. It almost went bankrupt around 1900. And to save it from bankruptcy, he turns to his, to his buddy, J.P. Morgan himself. And Morgan says, okay, my son, I will bail you out. <laughs> In return for which, uh, the entire corp, the entire office, all the officers of the court railroad were Morgan people, top Morgan people. Vice presidents was this guy Oakman, I already mentioned, who was the president of Guaranteed Trust Company, which is the Morgan, the major Morgan commercial bank, Guaranteed Trust. It's not, right now they have the Morgan Guaranteed, Morgan, J.P. Morgan merged with Guaranteed Trust, and it's now Morgan Guaranteed Trust. And the other vice president, Edward, Con Edward Converts, who was a, the president of Bankers Trust Company, which Morgan set up in 1900, 1901, to do the trust business, you know, the whole tr trust instruments are a modern instrument. Important instrument. So they, we're going to set up the Bankers Trust Company to specialize in that. So the two vice presidents of, of Hudson Manhattan, two of both top Morgan people, not just secondary Morgan people, but top people, Oakman and Converse, and other official, other directors included Judge Gray, I mean, excuse me, Judge Gary, head of U.S. Steel, top Morgan person, Frederick Jennings, partner of Stetson, Jennings, and Russell of the top Morgan law firm. Remember Francis Lynn Stetson, Jennings of the partner of his, and so on down the line, a whole bunch of people. Vice President of Guaranteed Trust, a guy who was the brother-in-law of George Baker, head of the First Bank of New York, First National Bank of New York, which is the top Morgan bank, along with Guaranteed Trust. So we had the whole thing, the whole, every director was a top Morgan person. So when, uh, when he becomes Secretary of Treasury, uh, McAdoo very quickly cements his position by marrying the daughter of Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> He becomes the son-in-law of Wilson. Later on, and during the war, he becomes the head of the nationalized railroad system. And uh, he also becomes, uh, by the way, in the 1920s, he runs for, he almost becomes the Democratic nominee for president in 1924, running on a Ku Klux Klan ticket. By this time, he moved to Alabama, and the Ku Klux Klan was all in favor of him. Why were they all in favor of him? Because he was a pietist, in favor of prohibition, in favor of crushing Catholics, and all the rest of the stuff that we now Ku Klux Klan, you have to realize, is not just anti-black or anti-Semitic, it's also anti-Catholic, a key thing in the 1920s. It becomes very powerful in the 1920s, not only in the South, but also in the North. In Oregon, Indiana, New Jersey, places like that, on an anti-Catholic anti ticket, anti-Catholic plank, that's one. So, uh, in 1924, it's almost funny, because the, the run for Democratic Party nomination, skipping ahead here, of course, but the 24th the Democratic ticket, we have McAdoo running as a Southern on the Ku Klux Klan ticket, Progressive Morgan Ku Klux Klan ticket, running against him is Alfred E. Smith, governor of New York, a Roman Catholic, Irish Roman Catholic, and the and the and the convention took place in New York City. All these Southern Baptists and Methodists are coming up, thinking that the Jesuits are going to knife them at any moment from behind the from behind the arras. <laughs> so they're coming up, and H. L. Mencken has a wonderful description of the convention. It was very hot, no air conditioning. Remember. And he, he took him 104 ballots. It took him two or three weeks of voting. You can imagine the hysteria here. It was very hot, 100 degree heat every day. With, with, <laughs> and with, with very, you know, packed crowds and then nobody can breathe in this thing. Very hot. And, the, and a fantastic struggle between, between Southern, Southern Piatus and, and Irish Catholics in New York. When neither of them gets it, and a the so-called compromise candidate wins in the last minute. And the 104th ballot. Now you're lucky if you go two ballots, you know, for presidential nomination. On the 104th ballot, John W. Davis, who's a compromise candidate. Who is John W. Davis? Morgan, Morgan's partner, Morgan lawyer, top lawyer from Morgan, from J.P. Morgan Company, becomes the candidate. So, uh, anyway. <laughs>
Um, leaping ahead, that's okay. It shows you how all these things have a continuity in this whole business. Everybody else, the whole cabinet is essentially selected by Colonel House. Uh, McReynolds from Tennessee is Attorney General. Uh, Franklin Lane is, is the, uh, the uh, California Secretary of the Interior. Uh, he's a pro shipper. The interesting thing about him is he was a San Francisco shipper. Uh, what's happening now, by the way, in the railroad industry is that shippers are beginning to take over the Interstate Commerce Commission. The railroads have been running it until about 1900. And as shippers, in other words, the people who want low freight rates, are beginning to take over. Franklin Lane was one of the people. He'd been a member of the ICC. And the, in other words, the ICC is now flipping out of railroad control into the control of the shippers. And so I see the railroads are going to look around for other, other ways of fertilizing the system. Um, Postmaster General is selected by Colonel House, the Secretary of Navy is selected by Colonel House, Secretary of Agriculture is also. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture is essentially um, David Houston, who was a Texas person, even though he came from Missouri. He was originally president of the University of Texas, and president of Texas A&M. Selected by Colonel House, and of course, therefore, in with House. The Secretary of Commerce looks like to be a Rockefeller person. He's the trustee of William Redfield, trustee of Equitable Life Insurance Company. He's a sort of Rockefeller, Rockefeller age. And the Secretary of Labor, which is a new post, uh, had made, been made a separate department now, was a union official, the first union official ever to be a cabinet member. William Wilson of Pennsylvania had been Secretary Treasurer of the United Mine Workers, was nominated by Gompers, and he was they asked Gompers to do it, he wouldn't do it, he selected. Uh, so that's the AFL post Secretary of Labor. So the tie in of the corporatism with, with labor unions. The ambassador to Great Britain, which was very important in getting, getting us into the war, was Walter Hines Page, who was a uh, Virginia newspaper man, old friend of Wilson, and um, oh, virtually a British agent. He acted as if he were a British agent, put it that way. He was a. Uh, uh, very wealthy and his vice president of Doubleday Company. His the salary was essentially paid for by Cleveland Dodge, who a special subsidy. And uh, no doubt in with a Morgan interest. It's like also a tool of Colonel House and selected by House once again. And so House and Page form a team to get us into the war. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but essentially World War One I, I consider World War One the most important event of the twentieth century, the most important political event. It's determined everything ever since. Everything, everything that's happened in world affairs and foreign policy in the 20th century is a result of World War One. a result of the whole, so we'll deal a little bit with that either today or next time. Uh, and, um, as a matter of fact, the one, in SS 104, my, my friend Professor Kreiling teaches when he taught 104, centerpiece of 104 was World War One. That's really the key. The rest of the stuff is really just playing out the, uh, the drama that happened then. Um, Okay, so those are the personnel, and we'll see that the two major, the two major events of the Wilson administration, before the war, that is, the night, both happening in 1913, as soon as he gets in, he starts pushing these things. The two major things he does, he puts in a, an interstate commerce commission for industry. In other words, he finally achieves the, the, uh, the uh, agitation, he achieves the, the goals sought by the National Civic Corporation, and all these guys from, for 14 years, he achieves a Federal Trade Commission, puts it in 1913, to do for industry what the ICC had done for um, railroads, what the Department of Agriculture had done for agriculture, etc., etc. He puts in a Federal Trade Commission, and also changes the whole banking system. I don't want to get too technical on that, but he changes the entire banking system by putting in a Federal Reserve System, nationalizing the banking system, creating a, a national engine for inflation supported by the federal government. So those are the two major events before the war in 1913, and uh, which Wilson immediately drives through. The Federal Trade Commission is driven for by, uh, by all these people we've been talking about, all the Morgan types, all the National Civic Federation. Uh, what they do is they outlaw unfair competition, uh, have a Federal Trade Commission to regulate industry and all that. Um, one of the main people who wrote, who helped write the legislation, in other words, was uh, actually physically writing it in many drafts, but it was Arthur Eddy, a very interesting character, who was a big shot Chicago corporate lawyer. Uh, Arthur Eddy wrote a book called 
the new competition in 1912, and many, many editions, I think five or six editions in the last next few years. It's a very interesting book. I, I read this book. I got a hold of a copy. And, um, and remember, he was one of the writers, the authors of the Federal Trade Commission Act. And he said the slogan, and he also was a specialist in creating trade associations, so creating cartel, cartelizing uh, devices in industry, which would set quotas, you know, increase prices and cut production. Um, and he writes a, in this book, he says the slogan on top of the book, in other words, he started off also writing a new competition. The slogan has a slogan that says, competition is war and war is hell. That's, his, that's the theme of his life. In other words, therefore, you got rid of, get rid of competition. Uh, and, and he says we have to have more trade associations, more cartels, we have to repeal the Sherman Act, pass a federal licensing law which would organize cartels directly, set up a federal trade commission to that end, and uh, enforce it, have the government enforce price agreements to keep prices up, production agreements to, keep, to cut production. This, of course, is what Mussolini did later. In other words, after World War I, Mussolini adopts this policy, uh, fascist economic policy, known as the corporate state, uh, which essentially adopts the Morgan Rockefeller type, Rothschild type corporate system, and organized all of the Italian industry into, into associations, uh, creating unions to represent labor workers, industry associations to represent industry, and have the government enforce the whole thing and set up these agreements. To, to uh, regulate production and prices. So, uh, and the, uh, the, Ro the Roman Catholic Church in the 1920s was quite friendly to this idea. I, I guess we'll, we'll cure, in other words, we eliminate class conflict by having a harmony through uh, corporatism, through corporate state. Uh, the Dolphus regime in Austria uh, in the 1930s was essentially a fascist, a corporate state concept. And many, many, many uh, countries in, Western, in Eastern Europe, and also, of course, the Nazi regime took over the this doctrine, uh, in that didn't pursue it completely. He says, for example, Eddie says, competition is selfish unless you replace by cooperation. What he meant by cooperation, of course, is cartels. He says, competition is a terrible thing, it destroys destructive, the stable prices. Well, of course it is, because prices price have to fall with competition. Stabilizing prices is another term, it's a code word for keep, keeping prices up. It's like, the, it's like Bush, by the way. I mean, Bush comes in and has a nerve to call for or tax cheaper oil. And, uh, and uh, Bush being as a Texas oil man, of course, and his father was a Texas oil man, well, they come from Connecticut, or preppies. Uh, he's a Texas oil man, so he, he's, he's, he's worried about the fact that oil is finally cheap at long last, uh, since 19, first, first time since 1972. So, uh, <clears throat> competition says Eddie is inhuman and erratic, and so forth and so on. And um, he said, here's another great, great quote from Eddie. Uh, competition free and unfettered is absolutely destruct destructive to all stability of prices. I mean, prices can't be kept up. Before the interstate commerce law regulating railway rates, competition uh, resulted in, excuse me, competition reigned. To a certain extent, the railroads from time to time cooperated to control conditions by pools and associations. And this is sort of summing up the terms so far. But not until the government stepped in and called a halt to vicious competition were rates regulated in any permanent manner, unquote. So he's actually summing up what I've been talking about. In other words, here we have you know, competition, business that don't like competition, they turn to the government, they try to achieve monopoly prices or cartel prices in the free market. It doesn't work. They turn to the government, the federal government particularly, to do it for them in the name of, the name of something else, the name of democracy or whatever. So and then he says he's, we have to have legislation to do for general business what the ICC did for the railroads. Okay? So, uh, and he says he likes the, as far as the socialist goes, he likes the philosophical socialist writers, he calls them, who are not Marxists, who, who he hails, who in favor of the trust as a forerunner of socialism. He likes that. It's good to have, to have government regulated trusts who can work with them. These are called so called right wing socialists in this period, <coughs> who, who are pro state. See, the thing about the left wing socialists, the Marxist Leninist type, they tend to oppose the government, you know, the existing government. The right wing socialists would work happily with as sort of the, the left wing, the, 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 the cooperative left wing opposition, His Majesty's loyal opposition, they call it in England, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. So that's okay to have that, as long as you're not going to try to break up this happy, harmonious setup. 
the only class in the country that says the benefits of free competition, I, I like this, this is a marvelous statement. The only class in the country that benefits from free competition are the non-producers who have fixed income. Who are you talking about? You're talking about us. You're talking about consumers. <laughs> you're, talking about the people, you're talking about the people who benefit. People who benefit from low prices, every one of us, the consumers. He says it's a class smaller numbers. I question that. <clears throat> At any rate, after the, Pre the Federal Trade Commission Act was passed in 1913, he writes a, several editions of his book. In 1915, he writes another edition, uh, fourth edition, and he says he hails the Federal Trade Commission as a, a good step forward because it, quote, outlaws unfair methods of competition, unquote. It's going to end cutthroat competition. It's another phrase, code word for competition. And also, he says it's going to lead to re resale price maintenance, a fair trade. It allows the government to set up minimum price regulations for industry, which is what they did for retail. They finally did it in 1930, the Robinson Patent Act, which, which uh, for a long time enforced legal price minima for products. In other words, if you, if you charge less than $10 for, for a bottle of vitamins, you're, you're declared illegal, things like that. This only got, the Supreme Court only declared this unconstitutional about 1970 or late, late 60s or something. So. For many years, about four decades, this sort of doctrine uh, prevailed to benefit the organized retailers at the benefit of the, at the expense of the public. In other words, to cartelize the retail industry to keep prices up. Uh, it's called resale price maintenance. <coughs> Great term. Terms are always pretty, pretty shrewd. Uh, so the Federal Trade Commission Act paves the way for that. It's, it's, uh, it's the first step resale price maintenance, and also to eliminate so-called unfair competition. So all business, almost all business groups when the Federal Trade Commission was being passed loved it. They said, this is great stuff, it's going to regulate industry, um, it's, going to, uh, it's, going to, it's going to stabilize the system and so forth and so on. Two people, two lawyers, have played a very prominent role in setting up the Federal Trade Commission. So Victor Mor 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 Morowitz who was a Morgan lawyer. Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe lawyer, and Francis Lynn Stetson, I mentioned many times in this course, a powerful figure, and Morgan's top attorney, attorney for J.P. Morgan and Company, J.P. Morgan personally, Cleveland's, Grover Cleveland's part, all partner, uh, who pops up constantly in this whole period, Francis Lynn Stetson, Morgan's lawyer. They essentially wrote the, these two guys mainly wrote the Federal Trade Commission Act. Also helped by George W. Perkins, Morgan partner, Morgan himself, Belmont, Gompers, James W. Jenks, Cornell University professor. All these guys are in on this. Um, finally comes to fruition under, under, under Wilson. Also, the, uh, when, the, when the FTC was passed, business groups hailed it. The Chicago Association of Commerce praised it. The National Chamber of Commerce. By the way, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, interesting little fact, was created by President Taft just before he re retired from office. In late 1912, he said, we need a, uh, an organization of businessmen who will speak for business. So essentially, he prom pr promoted this, and they came into being as a result of government encouragement. So the Chamber of Commerce, of course, loved this. <laughs> um, New York State Chamber of Commerce loved it. The National Association of Manufacturers, which had tr traditionally been a lazy affair after, was split. They were not sure. They were ambiguous on this. They were, but everybody else, of course, the National Civic Federation loved it, Chamber of Commerce loved it, Eddie loved it, Stetson loved it, you know, the whole, the whole gang. Of course, they wrote it and then they loved it. Anyway, and then the question is, who becomes, remember, we have to realize, we have to always assess the, the so-called Ralph Nader, what I call the Ralph Nader myth, that all these things were set up by progressive anti-business forces and then the businessmen took it over later. Well, who wrote it? We've already seen who wrote it. Marlon, Stetson, Eddie, and these people. Who was appointed, who, who became members of the Federal Trade Commission? Five-man commission. Who's running it Who's from the very beginning? Well, the key figure, the chairman, rather, was, was Joseph E. Davies, who was a young Democratic leader, I think life insurance lawyer in Madison, Wisconsin, who punked out after a very short period of time. He really wasn't, he was more, more interested in foreign affairs. He was interested very soon in getting us into war. And so he sort of more or less left the commission. He was sort of a figurehead that he, if you look at Joseph E. Davies, he was, had been head of the Bureau of Corporations, which we saw was the Teddy Roosevelt creation, it's the predecessor of the Federal Trade Commission, sort of the beginning of it. Obviously sympathetic to this whole concept. 
His later, what happened to him later is he happened to marry Marjorie Post, the uh, heiress of the post for, post postage fortune, and became, of course, multi-millionaire. Uh, and um, he later, in World War II, became ambassador to Russia, Roosevelt's ambassador to Russia. We, <laughs> wrote an infamous book called Mission of Moscow, which he claimed that Stalin was a great guy, a heroic, <laughs> heroic uh, Democrat. <laughs> and was, that was the period where the Morgans were all in favor of Russia. They, they have to realize that Thomas W. Lamont, Morgan's partner, uh, a very powerful Morgan partner, later on, actually started this in World War I, too, uh, was pushing the idea that Russia was a great democratic country uh, in World War II. Uh, so this is, uh, he was not a communist, <laughs> he was just a Morgan person. <laughs> At any rate, the, um, the, the real head of the Federal Trade Commission was the vice chairman, as I say, Joe Davies quickly essentially became inactive. So the vice chairman has the key role, he was Edward Hurley, he was head of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, later became head of the Nationalized Railroads in World War I. So he was the vice chairman and he was the had the, was president of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, and uh, really running the thing in the first, first few years. He was the founder of the pneumatic tool industry, so he was an important Chicago manufacturer. Uh, so he was giving, he gave a lot of very interesting speeches. I say he was running the thing, and he was praised overwhelmingly by businessmen. They he loved them in return. So, for example, uh, I'll give you a couple of quote, good quotes from Hurley. He said that he addressed the Association of National Advertisers December 1915. Uh, and he said, <clears throat> quote, through a, through a period of years, the government has been gradually extending its machinery of helpfulness. I like that. Machinery of helpfulness. Uh, railroads and shippers, he said, have the ICC. It's the same theme with Eddie. I mean, all these guys say more or less the same thing. Railroads and shippers had the ICC for many years, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the bankers had the Federal Reserve System, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, the farmers had the Department of Agriculture. General business needs to have something done to before that. So, quote from Hurley, to do for general business that which these other agencies do for the groups for which I have, to which I have referred. None of these guys can write very well, anyway. To, to do for the groups which, to which I have referred was the thought behind the creation of the Trade Commission. Unquote. Now, Wilson fully supported Hurley on this. Wilson sent messages early saying, you're doing a great job, I agree with all you're saying. Also, one of the things he would do is, Hoover did the same thing. Hurley would write a speech for Wilson praising Hurley. <laughs> In other words, he'd write the, Hurley would write the speech saying, Ed Hurley's doing a great job, and Wilson would then deliver the speech. Uh, during World War I, Hoover did the same thing. He'd write a speech for Wilson saying, Hoover's doing a great job. <laughs> anyway, if you want to get endorsed by the president, write the endorsement yourself. Uh, at least if you're Hurley of, of Hoover. He also addressed the National Industrial Conference Board, which is a group that still exists, of course, which is a group set up by business to bring statistical information to bear on, on government planning. <clears throat> and, he, and he said, it's kind of cute. He, wrote, he said this on July 16. He says, I don't know anything about the law. And that applies to the Clayton Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act. In other words, he doesn't know, know anything about the law which he was administering. In my position on the Federal Trade Commission, I'm there as a businessman. When I was offered the place, I told the president all I knew was business. I knew nothing about the new laws, nor the old ones, and I would apply the force that I sought that I might have in the interest of business. I think that the businessmen of this country will bear me out when I say that I try to work only in the interest of business. And nobody would make that kind of a flat statement nowadays when people are more public relations oriented. <laughs> but here he's you know, flat out. Uh, that's what he's doing. So, so big businessmen, they love Hurley, they love the Federal Trade Commission, they love to be regulated. In other words, one of the themes of this course, one of the basic themes of the business, it's, most, it's thought by most people, I think, that businessmen are always in favor of laissez-faire, they're always against, against government intervention. Ain't true. It certainly was not true in this whole period from 1900 on, or from late 19th century on. Quite the, quite the opposite, the drive of these businessmen was to try to create government as a cartelizing device, the government to come in there, regulate, restrict, control, limit competition. <clears throat> and raise profits. So uh, Wilson himself was in favor of this kind of price fixing thing and, um, and um, the uh, Wilson gave a speech also in 1916 where he said the Federal Trade Commission has transformed the government of the United States from being an antagonist of business into being a friend of business. Well the only one thing is it was never, it was, it never really been an antagonist at any rate. Other people on the Federal Trade Commission and the other three people, let's say Davies and Hurley, 
George Rubley was a uh, George Rubley was a big shot in the Progressive Party, uh, 1912, and also a lobbyist of the United States Chamber of Commerce, and was the top official of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, a Wall Street lawyer, and uh, a friend for many years of Victor Morowitz, Morgan uh, Morgan lawyer. Dwight Morrow was a Morgan partner. By the way, there's several key Morgan partners I should mention now. As Morgan is getting older, plus his son also comes in. They have the, more, the key Morgan partners so far. Perkins, of course, we know about. George W. Perkins, Morgan partner. There's Robert Bacon, Morgan partner, with Secretary of State. There's Perkins, there's Thomas W. Lamont, Morgan partner. There's Dwight Morrow. Who's the father-in-law of Charles Lindbergh? In other words, Anne Morrow Lindbergh uh, married Charles Lindbergh, was, was the daughter of Dwight Morrow. And, uh, and there's Henry P. Davison, who we'll see in a minute, and Willard Strait, who comes out of the State Department, and Thomas W. Yeah, Thomas W. Mont. These are the Morgan partners that just, who are important in politics. I'm not concerned with the straight Morgan partners. A whole bunch of them are. We're doing other things in politics and, and merging. Well, then Strait comes out of the State Department and becomes a Morgan partner, sets up, this is very interesting, I think it's, an, it's to symbolize the alliance between government and uh, progressive Morgan people and progressive intellectuals, socialistic or progressive intellectuals. They decide to set up a new magazine, a weekly magazine to, to promote liberal and progressive ideas, progressive meaning status and corporatist. So they set up a new republic owned by Willard Strait also, Willard Strait, in addition to being more important, had the advantage of marrying a, a very wealthy woman who was a Whitney heiress, Dorothy Whitney, uh, who was the daughter of the top Whitney people. So Whitney being Morgan and Rockefeller connected, uh, Pratt, Pratt Whitney connected. So he starts off with a lot of money from his wife, Dorothy. If you want to, get, if you want to be successful in life, marry a rich, <laughs> rich heiress. <laughs> it's a good route. But anyway, he uses Dorothy Strait money and becomes sets up the New Republic, which sets up as editors three of the top corporatist, corporate state, neo-fascist, what are we going to call them, proto-fascist intellectuals in the country, and to edit this. It's still around, of course, the New Republic. Um, and they, when we entered World War I, they were the major people pushing, the major people pushing for the war effort. The three editors were, were the major editor was Herbert W. Crowley, um, one of my least favorite people. <laughs> This whole period is a big shot of intellectual. He was a um, Hamiltonian, constantly wrote Arctic books, famous book called The New Nationalism. He's a big pal of Teddy Roosevelt, supplying Teddy Roosevelt a lot of intellectual ammunition. In favor of big state, strong state, executive tyranny, uh, Hamilton is against Jefferson, against individual liberty, against the free market, and you know, on and on. In favor of corporatism, the whole bit. Um, in favor of war, in favor of. Uh, Strong staff. I think he probably favored eugenics too. When uh, his father was a Saint Simonian, to get the, this is, uh, I get real technical, it goes back to the French socialist, fascist socialist, intellectual Saint Simon, who was, I believe, was a socialist who believed in dictatorship by the elite, especially bankers. So, uh, <laughs> the banker socialist. <laughs> but this fits in beautifully with Morgan. Why not? <laughs> by the way, one of the top socialist intellectuals in this country this period was George. I think I mentioned Charles Steinmetz, famous electrical inventor. Uh, Steinmetz is a chief ele ele electrical theorist, electrician, we call it, electrical engineer for General Electric, a Morgan company. And Charles Steinmetz wrote a couple of books calling for socialism. It turned out what he meant by socialism was, was a world run by one big corporation. Uh, <laughs> uh, preferably General Electric. With and himself supplying the ideas. In other words, they're like we listen to theoreticians like himself. So essentially, what he wanted was Steinmetz world socialism. <laughs> Steinmetz is a world socialist dictator. So, uh, there's a very good book on all this, by the way, I, if you want to read in this. There's a guy named David Gilbert, who wrote an excellent book, which has been sort of neglected, called Designing the, Designing the Industrial State. And he deals with what he calls collectivist intellectuals. And Gilbert himself was a new left historian in the 1960s. And uh, he deals with proper acidity with uh, what he calls collectivist intellectuals, these the technocrat types, and uh, people like Steinmetz. He has a whole chapter on Steinmetz. Uh, 
going into some sardonic detail in his character. Anyway, so <laughs> any anyway, so Crowley is a uh, was that kind of a guy. He was also in the 1920s and he was editor of New Republic. He hailed Mussolini's regime as being an excellent, marvelous solution. It was essentially pro-fascist. But you have to realize that liberals and businessmen all during the 1920s and early 30s were in favor of Mussolini. So it was great. Strong, you had everything. You had class harmony instead of class struggle. You had, instead of having proletarian types, you have the whole, the whole country integrated in big government, fixing production, fixing prices, cartelizing the system, creating organic, with the organic nation you know, running everything. Uh, and uh, they loved that. I mean, so fascism was really liked by most Americans, the entire American establishment, totally uh, war against the uh, Ethiopia. So the Italian Abyssinian War in 1935 was it. Until then, they all loved it. And so the fact that a few people were tortured here and there was sort of sloughed, sloughed over. So he's one of our good, he would now be considered a good dictator, <laughs> a good free world advocate. <laughs> a free world dictatorial advocate who's uh, authoritarian rather than totalitarian, I guess, in the current jargon. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> So it's only, as I say, with the Ethiopian War that everybody turned against the Mussolini. Before that, so Crowley had all sorts of articles, editorial in the Republic, praising Mussolini as a great guy. Maybe the trains run on time, the famous phrase that was used. But at any rate, uh, the other two guys were Walter Weil uh, and Walter Lippmann. Came, then became a famous pundit and columnist and all that. <clears throat> so we had then. This, to me, this symbolizes the Morgan Progressive Intellectual Alliance, and a living embodiment in the New Republic magazine, <coughs> uh, which was founded in 1912, ready to hail the Wilson administration. So Lippmann gets to be, Lippmann was the youngest one of that group. He just graduated from college a couple of years before, big shot in the Intercollegiate Socialist Society, and then he, he gets to be a real big shot. He loves it. There's a very good book on Lippmann by Ronald Steele, a very long biography, which deals with, with him in some detail. Federal Reserve System is another, again, another story. It's, it's, I don't want to get too technical on the Federal Reserve System. Extremely important development. What had happened was, as uh, Coco points out, the banks were getting too competitive. In other words, the banks were getting, from the uh, time of the Civil War, which set up a quasi-centralized government, a banking system, uh, with the outlawing of state bank notes, centralizing Wall Street. Wall Street was getting less and less Strong. In other words, Chicago was becoming an important banking center on its own hook. And Kansas City was becoming an important banking center system. People were using the state banks more and more against the national banks. And so the Wall Street banks were beginning to lose control over the banking system. Um, also, it wasn't inflationary enough. In other words, it wasn't, they, wasn't, they weren't able to inflate. As soon as they inflated, there'd be a recession. There'd be prices would go up. People would call upon the banks for redemption in gold. There'd be a recession. And then the banks would collapse. And so in 1907, there was a big banking panic. And so the Morgans, once again, and plus the other people, this, in this case, everybody agreed. You know, all, all the top, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, Kuhn Lowell, they all agreed you have to have a central bank. They had to adopt this pro progressive system, which had been pioneered by England in the late 17th century and then adopted by most other countries in the 19th century. You need a central bank to do what? To, to prop up the banks, to, to, to be able to have inflation, cheap credit, inflationary bank credit, controlled by the government, and so no one bank in general will collapse, in other words, to sort of support the whole system. The central bank to be what the English banking theorist Walter Badgett said, the land, lender of last resort. In other words, to bail out banks in trouble, okay? So the central bank is a lender of last resort. <clears throat> it centralizes reserves and inflates. It also can purchase government bonds, prep, you know, finance government deficits if necessary. So the central bank is, a, is an inflationary and centralizing device. And uh, it was, the public didn't like it. See, the public was generally suspicious of Wall Street for good reason, suspicious of central banks. They had to sell it to the public. And they sold, just like the establishment sold the Federal Trade Commission and the meatpacking stuff and all the rest of it as ways to check big business. Where it really was a monopolizing device, they sold it as a way to promote competition. Similarly, they sold the central bank, they sold the federal reserve system as a way to check inflation, to keep a lid on inflation. The banks are ter too inflationary. We need a central bank to prevent inflation, to regulate the system. So in other words, this federal reserve system operated and still operates as a cartelizing device for banks. It does for banks what the Federal Trade Commission did for general business, what the 
ICC did for the railroads, or the Civil, Civil, Aeronautic, Civil Aeronautic Board has did for the airlines before they went out of business last year. All these efforts do, they, they cartelize the system, they restrict production, raise prices, keep out up, ent new entry. So the Federal Reserve System is a way of cartelizing the banking system. So the banks loved it. And here the banks are being allegedly restricted, right? In other words, according to the propaganda, the banks are being restricted. They're being curbed and limited by the Fed. Do you think they'd hate the Fed? They love the Fed. Why do they love the Fed? Because the Fed cartelizes them, the same way as the Second Bank of the United States uh, in the early 19th century. They love these banks, which they're supposedly supposed to hate, because they pop up the system. They bail out banks in trouble. They cartelize, they inflate, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and of course, sometimes there's marginal dis disagreements, obviously. They don't inflate enough for a certain bank, but basically the system, they love the system. And all these guys supported it. They had to do, uh, they had to, um, the bankers, the American Bankers Association starts the parade. The Morgans love it, the Chamber, the Chamber of Commerce love it. Uh, they have to jockey for, 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 they have a jockey for power, they have a jockey for how to write this thing, and they have to worry about the Republicans and Democrats both liking it. So what happened was, originally it was, the original uh, supporter was Nelson Aldrich, was the Rockefeller in-law, Senator Nelson Aldrich. And during the Taft administration, the Federal Reserve Bank proposal was called the Aldrich Plan. Okay. So, uh, but it was, a, and it, was a, it was a classic meeting, and the bankers loved it. Uh, Hepburn of the Chase, one of the key figures in this is A. Barton Hepburn, who was head of the Chase National Bank, which in those days was Morgan. Uh, they had a secret meeting. It was one of the classic things, which uh, was exposed many years later uh, at Jekyll's Island in, in December 1910, the latter, latter days of the Taft administration, middle of the Taft administration. A secret meeting at Jekyll's Island, which was, which was a private island south, off the coast of South Carolina. Uh, no, excuse me, off the coast of Georgia, I think. And, they, and uh, it was very hush hush because they wanted to have a secret meeting without the press finding out about it. So they took, they chartered, Aldrich chartered a train from New York, a train to go down to Jekyll's Island. And he told them we're going on, he told the press we're going on a duck hunting expedition. Just a few wealthy friends duck hunting in Jekyll's Island. We still don't know to this day who, so you have to use, if you're a private island like that, very swanky, you have to use the, you have to be invited by some guest. We don't quite know who's guest, who the guest host was, but the deep suspicion must have been J.P. Morgan. He's the only guy. None of these guys were members of Jekyll Island Club, but J.P. Morgan was. I think they used his home or something. Anyway, so Ulrich sets this thing up at J.P. Morgan's mansion down there. Uh, and uh, the members, very, just a few people, and what they did is they spent a whole week there and they hammered out the federal, essentially the Ulrich plan, the Federal Reserve Commission Act. Under the lip, Rockefeller. Uh, Henry P. Davison, Morgan partner, and uh, Paul Warburg, Kuhn Loeb, one of the relatives of Jacob Schiff. Warburg, a uh, German, was brought over from Germany and paid the partner of Kuhn Loeb, I think, his entire time was spent lobbying for agitating for the Federal Reserve System. In other words, that was, he, didn't, he didn't have he didn't do actual he didn't do actual banking work. He was paid, I think, something like eight hundred thousand dollars a year, which are those which now amounts to about six million a year, something like that. He was paid what's in real terms a current dollar six million a year to do nothing but lobby for, for the Federal Reserve System. So uh, he uh, he was a relative of Schiff and Kuhn and Loeb, etc., eminently famous Warburg family. So we have then these were the, essentially. These are the four guys at the, at, the, at the meeting. Five guys. No, a guy named Norton. Okay, Charles Norton, who was the head of the First National Bank, which was also a Morgan. Okay. One, Morgan had two top banks: Guaranteed Trust Company and uh, and uh, First National. He also had. Uh, he was, this is a Morgan partner. So we had Morgan partner, J.P. Morgan and Company Investment Bank. We had Charles Norton of the Morgan's First National Bank, in New York, which is now, by the way, uh, became part of National City. 
Um, and uh, so two Morgan people, two Rockefeller people, and one Kuhn Loa person. So five, a good distribution of power. Plus one kept professor to actually write up the act. You have to have a technician, okay, an economist named A. Pyatt Andrew of Harvard to actually write the thing up. So, <laughs> sort of unknown professor. No, he's not very well known in the economic circle, but he was there to write, you know, draft the legislation and all that. So, uh, so it's a very small conference, very small, very high level, and they drafted, as I say, this act. In other words, what you had here is an agreement, okay, hammered out, three forces, many of which were hated each other's guts at other levels. Rockefeller's Morgan's and Kuhn Law. This is important. This is a banking system. This is money. This is credit, money, banking. They all agreed on the basics, on the basics of it. So they drew up the plan, all which is supposed to push it through. And what happened then is that the, the Democrats, um, excuse me, the election of 1910, Democrats won the ele election in the House of Representatives. So they had to wait. Aldrich's plan was now, Aldrich's name was, was disliked, of course, by Democrats. So you had to, they had to, they had to wait for a year and set up lobbying institutions to make it bipartisan. So they had to bring the Democrats in. Democrats won the House of Representatives in 1910. They won the presidential election in 1912. They couldn't have a Republican name on it. You had to have Democratic name on it. And so they waited until Wilson was elected, and then when, when the Democrats took control of Congress, they got Carter Glass, who's a Democratic congressman from Virginia, to put his name on the, on the, on the legislation. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, they also set up a, uh, a phony citizens group in Chicago called the Citizens League for Sound Money, something like that. Uh, calling for a Federal Reserve System, because they, they, they want to make, make it as if it's a grassroots movement, not just a few bankers. They want to see the public is behind it. And Chicago sounded safe, you know, because New York meant Wall Street. So they take it to Chicago and they, make, and they have a J. Lawrence Lachlan as a distinguished economist who's unfortunately in favor of the Federal Reserve System, as a major propagandist on behalf of the Morgan, of the of joint banker group calling himself citizens and all that. Actually, he admitted later on, of course, he was pure tool of the bankers. He was just, he was just operating as a banker person. At any rate, uh, <clears throat> so, and finally, as I say, when Wilson's elected, they've, they've pushed through, with, and they, make, they say it's not a central bank. See, they couldn't make it, if they had a straight central bank, one bank, the rest of the public, which is suspicious of, of banks in general, wouldn't like it. They, they said it's decentralized, it's not a central bank. Federal Reserve System with 13 chapters or branches or whatever it is. Uh, so they had a very cumbersome, phony, decentralized structure. It's really quite centralized, but they made it seem as if it's decentralized to appease the congressman. Okay, we're getting to exciting watershed in the World War One. Um, oh, before I get, I should mention the Federal Reserve System. Excuse me for finish that up. The uh, Federal Reserve Board, as I say, which came in um, December 1913 and then really starts functioning around the summer of, of fall 1914, and you have to get everything shaped up, uh, was a way of cartelizing uh, the banking system so as to per permit banks to continue inflating at a controlled rate, that was controlled by the government. Um, so no, the banks won't collapse, they can be a lender of last resort, uh, and the banks, could, the Federal Reserve can push reserves into the system. Uh, reserve requirements were lowered, thereby permitting an inflation of money. The way the banking system works, and I'll only do this very quickly because uh, I can't get into the tech, tech, techniques or technology or of the banking system here, but basically the banking system, the commercial banking system, Chase and, you know, and Bank of Chembank and all that, are, are inflationary engines. In other words, they're ways to increase the money supply. They're substitutes for counterfeiting. Uh, counterfeiters print money, you know, you take, you take dollar bills, you print money, and you use a $10 bill, and you spend them. Banks create fake warehouse receipts. In other words, you deposit cash in a bank, okay? So let's say you deposit cash, we're going to quickly. Uh, you then have, this is the balance sheet of the bank, right? These are assets, and these are liabilities, plus equity, uh, really means in macro, I go for money banking, of course, I go through this whole thing step by step. But basically what you have is you deposit, let's say you deposit $100 in cash in a bank. Cash could be gold, it could be federal, you know, treasury bills or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. It's cash, okay? 
uh, you get then, the, the bank then has $100 of, say, cash. The bank gives you in return for that a warehouse receipt saying you will you you can claim this at any time you can claim the hundred dollars at any time you want on demand like a warehouse you know you deposit a watch in a warehouse and say or furniture or something you get your have your ticket and your warehouse receipt you pay a fee for it for storing it and you can redeem the damn watch or chair at any time okay? so this is the so you have a hundred dollars of where balance by hundred dollars of warehouse receipts which can uh, take which have taken two forms over the centuries. One is a note, a physical note, like a pawn ticket or a warehouse receipt saying the, the bank of uh, Oshkosh or the bank of Great Neck promises to give you on the redeem on demand or pay you back on demand $100 in cash on the presentation of the ticket. Okay, that's one way. This is called a bank note. The other way, a more sophisticated way, which is only which originally only done for large businessmen. In other words, this is the basic way the, the, the average person had a bank note. Uh, the other way, which is which is usually done for large merchants or big business types or international traders, etc., is by having uh, open book accounts. In other words, instead of actually getting a physical note, you just get a record on the bank that they owe you $100, and you don't get any physical record. What you get um, is a as a as a bunch of as a transfer order. You get, you have a deposit or demand deposit. An open book account with the bank of a hundred dollars instead of a bank note. In the old days, you could have a combination. You could have a fifty dollars of bank notes, a fifty dollars of demand deposit, whatever you want. Uh, the way you the way you transfer a warehouse receipt, you simply sell it to somebody. You, know, you buy something with it. You, you take the hundred dollar. You have the demand on the bank. You have a hundred dollars. If the bank is considered honest and upstanding, ever the warehouse receipt functions as if it were cash. As if it were gold or whatever it is, if they trust the bank. The bank has good reputation. They'll then a merchant or somebody selling you something will take the bank note instead of the instead of either you or him having to go to the bank and schlep to the bank and carry the gold out. They'll simply take the bank note as a, as a as a like traveler's checks are done now. They could take a traveler's check instead of the actual cash. Traveler's check is like a warehouse receipt. So either their bank notes or the demand deposit. In which case they accept a transfer order. Uh, you say. Now the transfer order says, Mr. Bank, you know, Bank of, of uh, J Street, right? Bank of J Street, dear sir, pay to the order of Joe Jones 100 bucks, all right, signed Murray Rothbard. So then they take my $100 account and transfer the open book, instead of being done through an actual physical note, transfer it, their liability, their, their, their liability from me to, to, to John Jones. This is, of course, it's called a check. But a check is, is a transfer order to the bank saying, Mr. Bank, please sign by me. Let's say, please take $100 which you now owe me and transfer it to John Jones. Uh, if the bank is well known, if I'm well known in this case, then John Jones will accept the check okay, and then deposit it in his bank. At any rate, this becomes, over the years, the man deposit or the warehouse receipt becomes equivalent to cash. Uh, the, the chances for, inf for inf counterfeiting, I call counterfeiting, are limited in, this, in a free banking situation of this sort. The temptation for counterfeiting comes about when a bank says, look, these suckers, don't, don't, they trust me, they don't, they don't come and demand the cash anymore because they think that I have the money here, and I owe it to them. But on the other hand, there are very few of them really show up anymore. Let me, let me start either stealing the gold itself and lending it out, or else printing fake warehouse receipts and lending those out. And it'll be accepted as if they're the same thing as regular warehouse receipts, which is what the bank started to do after centuries of getting reputation for honesty and probity and all that. They started printing fake warehouse receipts. Let's say, let's say $200 of warehouse receipt, whichever, either in bank deposit or bank note, and they lend it out. Print the $200, lend it out to some, you know, charge interest. So now they have $300 in liabilities and demand deposits or banknotes, right? And they have $200 of IOUs to, I don't know, Michelangelo, whatever it is, so, on which they get interest. This is the way banks expand. They expand in two ways, either by actually going, people depositing their money there, or, or by lending money, lending money to the banks, and they lend it out, or in the way of creating fake warehouse receipts, which they, which they then lend out. 
Uh, the banks can get away with it so long as they, people don't call for their, their money in any large amount. Okay, so this is called fractional reserve banking. Uh, in contrast to 100% reserve banking, where the banks actually keep the money. There's a whole argument between economists and moral theorists and legal theorists about whether this is fraud or not. Uh, I think it is, but at any rate, the, the point is that with fractional reserve banking, you now inflate, you create, create more dollars. The way you manufacture dollars and lend them out, this is an inflationary in instrument. In other words, it increases the money supply, not by digging gold out of the ground, but by just printing tickets or by creating money in, out of thin air in the bank account, in the bank, on the books of the bank. So in a free market, this is limited, limited play for this because if I create, let's say I have a Rothbard bank, I start printing, creating artificial warehouse receipts. Well, I only have a few clients, most of the other thousands of banks. Um, people, if I write out a check, if I lend out IOUs, if I, if I create a bank deposit for people, they'll start using the money to buy things, and as soon as they do that, the other bank, their bank, calls upon me for redemption. I haven't got the money, and I go bankrupt. So there's no way that individual banks can really make it. Can, can, can really have a play for this in a free system, free market system. The only way they can really accomplish this systematically and not be afraid of going under at any moment is by having a cartel. And the only way a cartel can succeed, like in any, any other industry, is by the government enforcing it, by the government organizing the cartel and enforcing it, limiting competition and pouring money in so it's a, and bailing out any bank in trouble as the whole banking system inflates together, happily inflates together, creates more money, drives up prices transfers wealth and income from other people to themselves. In other words, from people who are from the average consumer to the guys who are in on the credit system and borrow the money and all that sort of stuff, or in with the government. This is basically, uh, the way the governments have done this in the last couple hundred years is through the central bank, central bank system, which is a partnership of government and private banking. In other words, originally the Bank of England, the first central bank, organized in the 1690s, was simply a private corporation, which the government needed money. The king always needed money. Government was always dying for money. Their credit was exhausted because the king was confiscating. The king had borrowed money from the goldsmiths, who had a major amount of capital. And they, and they confiscated the gold to finance his war against the Puritans. So obviously, if the, you know, they're not ready to. And also, he stopped payment on various bonds that they issued. So if the king has no credit, who's going to borrow lend to him? So as a result, and he couldn't tax anymore because he would have had his head chopped off and he increased taxes in those days. There's no way he would try to get money. How do you get it? The, the promoters of the Bank of England came in with a scheme. Look, look, sire, you give us a monopoly in oil banking. You give us this in London and so forth and so on. You give us privileges. Uh, and we will then buy your, your, your financial deficits. We'll give you Bank of England notes, warehouse receipts. You can spend them. And that's what happened. It was a, it was a racket by which the government organized privileged the Bank of England and thereby and benefited from the fact the Bank of, the Bank of England would create money. Instead of the King of England printing the money, which looked bad, looked inflationary, they have a private corporation, a distinguished corporation, which then creates money out of thin air through, through this warehouse receipt system, fake warehouse receipt, and uses it to buy government bonds, which then the King spends, the government spends, everybody's happy except the poor public that finds the value of the, of the pound is going down. They don't know why. In most countries in the world, except the United States, government deficits are financed by the central bank. In England and Israel, almost all other countries, it's very easy to have a deficit. Just something the central bank just buy the buy the bonds, and increases the money supply in a, in a, in a very inflationary manner to do it. The Federal Reserve System doesn't it's done not quite as bad, but it's equivalent. Mm -hmm. The United States, as I say, had a semi-centralized banking system after the Civil mm -hmm. War, but not really fully central. And Wall Street was suffering, the banks were collapsing. So in order, so the bankers got together at Jekyll Island and other places. Well, this is all wings of the bankers. Rockefeller, Morgan, Kuhn, Lowell, they all agree you have to have cheap credit, you have the government bailing out of the banking system and organizing a cartel. And uh, of course, then the question is who runs it? We'll see. Central bank, I guess, together lowers the fractional reserve requirement so that you, you can print, the banks can create more money, creates a monopoly, does it through monopolizing banknotes. In other words, before 1913, the large national banks, the large Wall Street banks, printed notes. In other words, you could go to Chase Bank, let's say, or Chem, not Chem, Chase Bank or Citibank, and one or two, if you can get Chase Bank notes, which looks like Federal Reserve notes now. They're, they're just said Chase Bank will pay to the, pay to the, what is it, pay to the, 
for the account of? Pay to the something. Huh? Pay to the order. Yeah, well, I think it's, I don't know if it's pay to the order anyway. It's been so long since they had this on it, it's difficult to remember. But anyway, pay to the order of uh, the bearer $100 in gold, or $100 in treasury bills, usually gold. So, so, another, so the, there were individual banks, the large bank. Before the Civil War, every bank had banknotes. After the Civil War, as you remember, the, the state banks were prevented from doing it. Only large Wall Street banks could print banknotes. Now the Fed, only the Federal Reserve can print banknotes for the result of all of our paper money. If you look at your paper money, it says Federal Reserve note. And the banks then were limited to creating demand deposits. So if anybody wants a banknote, like for regular transaction, you're not going to pay a check to buy a newspaper or get a sandwich. So if you want a banknote or paper money, you have to go to the, your bank has to go to the Federal Reserve to, 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 to produce and sell the bank, so to speak. The money. So in other words, the way the central bank has control over the banking system is by having a monopoly, a legal monopoly, a coercive monopoly on the issue of notes, of paper money. So the banks want it. It's not that the banks don't like the monopoly. They love it because this, this gives the central bank control so the central bank can then inflate together. All the banks can now inflate together with the central bank doing most of the inflating. The way the central bank inflates is by creating reserves, creating more uh, cash, so to speak, or reserves on the central bank upon which the, the, the Banks can, banks can pyramid uh, in a frac multiple fraction. In other words, this is the Federal Reserve System. They had gold, which they pyramid, and then the banks can pyramid on top of that. The pyramid is right now 10 to 1, which is what it was in 1913. So it's, uh, in other words, for every dollar of reserves that the Fed creates, the banks can inflate 10 to 1 on top of it, creating fake warehouse receipts, demand deposits, which they multiply on top of reserves, which then goes into, becomes part of the money supply. Um, I, I'm not going to go to the mechanics of it. You can check any money in banking textbook to see how this works. But anyway, the, uh, basically what happens whenever the Federal Reserve buys an asset and, and gets deposited in the bank, uh, then the banks can pyramid 10 to 1 uh, and fake, fake warehouse receipts. And they can't go under because every bank does it together because the central bank is, is maneuvering the whole thing and the central bank bails them out. So it's very important for the bank to create this. I mean, if the banks want to inflate, we have to suffer the consequences. Um, the, uh, it was a bipartisan thing. It was passed very heavily but after a lot of jockeying position. As I said at the end of last hour, in order to sucker in the public, which had a healthy distrust of Wall Street, they claim it's not really a central bank. It's really decentralized because there's 12 chapters and whatever it is. It really was centralized. There was, however, a fight for power at the beginning. And in those days, the way the law was set up, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was the dominator of the system. Uh, after the 1930s, during the 1930s, the law was changed, and now the Federal Reserve Board in Washington runs the whole thing. The Federal Reserve Board of New York, the president of the Federal Reserve Board of New York was then the key figure. It was, of course, nominated and appointed by the Federal Reserve System, which is a partnership of government and the banks.